have today. So welcome along today. I'm just going to reshare my screen. I'm going to launch into this. So look, once again, as I said earlier, when we do these sessions, what we like to do is do make them as interactive as possible. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to engage in our first poll today. Now today is about leadership and specifically about leading in challenging or difficult times. And the reason that's so relevant is because of what's happening at the moment with the advent of COVID-19. It has absolutely decimated the way people are used to working and it's put a lot of pressure on everybody. Now, whether you are a leader by a hierarchical position or you're just the leader because of the mindset you have towards other people, it's kind of irrelevant. What we're gonna to do today is give you a framework that's gonna help you, particularly if you're a leader of teams, uh, a leader of a business or a leader of multiple teams to help create, bring a balance to your focus, okay? Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off by kind of getting a little bit of an understanding of what you think good looks like, irrelevant of tough times or not. So the first question I'm gonna ask you to kick into is this one here, which is what do the best leaders look like? So specifically, if you think about um, the leader that you know, or the, the best leader that, it's okay, Russell, I've got that. You've done it. All right, thank you. So think about the leader that you've ever had, best manager or leader you've ever had. The question I'm really kind of posing to you through that poll is what did they do that made them the best? So think about characteristics, think about behaviors. I'm, I'm really not talking, I'm not interested in the nice possible about their names or their companies or anything like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm really trying to work out what is it that you found about them that made them the best leader? That's awesome. So already we can see some people responding to that already. So we've got listened and empowered the team. Okay, fantastic. Uh, a people person, open and honest, employee centered, motivate others, listening, lead by example, transparency, good. Uh, carrying, uh, being yellow. Okay, um, a reference for those of you who've been through our, our jigsaw uh, program, I'm assuming. So I'm assuming that's, that's some energy and inspiration we'll take from this, staying calm. Empathy, it's another great word that we've talked about a lot over the last few weeks as well, is, is, is considering how other people are feeling. Charismatic, one who lead, not just manage. That's a really good concept because one of the first things we're gonna do, just so we have a shared understanding this morning, is distinguish between leadership and management. Because um, they both play a role, but they are different and they require different, different behaviors. Uh, what else have we got? Encouraging, godly. Okay, that's, that's one that would, with a capital G, that's one that we'd uh, be interested to explore as well. Um, I think defining what we mean by godly in the first place would, would be a good place to start with that. Okay. Um, transparency, motivate others, staying calm, managing failure. Okay, so look, uh, there, there's nothing in there that, that kind of surprises me. And when I think about the best leaders that I have, particularly the best manager that I ever had uh, in my career, um, was a lady called Caroline Taylor when I worked for AXA uh, Insurance back in the UK. And I think she, she was my manager's manager, right? And, and even though I had a good manager, she was unbelievable in terms of making me, and I, you know, there was a team of 22 of us plus two managers, but it wasn't just me. Everyone just feel a lot of these things on there, like listened, empowered. You know, we were given enough rope to hang ourselves is a very English expression to use. But, you know, if, if you wanted to do something and you had a case, she'd just let you go and do it with some direction, with some support, absolutely. But she actually, you know, it allowed you to create your own, um, for want of a better word, your own workflow, as long as it delivered on the team's goals. So uh, a lot of these things I would attribute to her and, and the way I always aspire to be as, as a leader of people as well is exactly like she was as well. So um, that, that's, that's one thing I always look to. Willing to mentor as well, that's really important. It's not just about telling, it is about showing the way and helping and guiding. Because if you just give people the answers all the time, they're never going to learn for themselves. So look, that's great. And guess what we're going to do now? I'm going to take this and I'm going to flick my question. So it's exactly the same uh, opening. There's a slight tweak on it, which is, instead of thinking about the best leader, I'd like you to think about the worst leader or manager you've ever had. What did they do that made them the worst? And just so we know, we're talking about worst, not worse. Worse is a comparison to something else. This is the absolute <laughs> pinnacle. So once again, if you can have a look at your poll, whether you've got that on your phone or in a different browser window, what was it that they did that made them what you consider to be the worst manager? Perfect. So the first one that pops up really big is micromanager. 
setting unrealistic goals, selfish, self-centered. Look at that. That's came in like really powerfully three in a row. Impulsive, favoritism, indecisive, nothing. What they literally, they did nothing either, you know, one who micromanaged. Are you still holding some issues <laughs> around that? I think, I think for every exclamation mark there, there's a month of therapy required maybe. Okay, being bossy, uh, micromanagement took the credit, all ideas are theirs yet, not fighting for the team. Okay, good. Blames people, indecisive, dishonest, political. Yeah, political and ego are two things. I'll be honest, that's why I no longer work in a large corporate environment. I don't Two things, I don't like playing the game. I'm not very good at it as well, but I've come across some really, really strange people with that. It's, it's such a limited, blinkered mindset. Took team wins as their own. Yeah, that's no good. A power tripper, being bossy, self-centered, selfish. Look, all of these things that are coming in here, throws you under the bus, yeah. Poor vision. All of these things that come in here, these are characteristics of someone that is 100% not a leader, okay? Now, I'll just start to clarify what I mean by that. They might be a manager, and I don't mean a manager in the right sense of the word. I mean on the fact that they have a position on an organizational chart. But if you've got people that are delivering these kind of characteristics, and now that you think back to how they made you feel, and I'm sure you know the statistic, and I, I, the actual percentage I'm sure is going to get wrong, but it's something like 60 or 70% of people that leave their job actually leave their manager, not their job. Um, so, you know, if you think about the negativity that that brings in. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes there is some issues with that individual, right? It could be some, some element of, 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 you know, a, I don't know, a psychological need to be powered. It could be something through their upbringing where, where they've seen whether it was their parents or a leader or a manager or a boss is a word that I don't like, that they had and they've tried to emulate that. But it just doesn't work. It doesn't help move things forward. Afraid to delegate, I've just come in there. That is one of my pet peeves. And if I could have one mission in life, it would be just getting people comfortable with handing work over, right? So look, as a lot of times, managers, however, often get promoted into a role and they're not prepared for that role, okay? That's exactly one of the reasons that companies like Ignite exist because we're actually able to help organizations and individuals prepare for those uplifts um, in, in, a, in a slightly more structured way. When we run these kind of programs live and I have the ability to have a bit of feedback from the audience, a question I always ask to people, particularly from their frontline roles, but it works at any level, is, is why were you promoted? And essentially the answer most of the time, if I just distill down what I get back from people is, well, I got promoted because I was good at what I was doing. That was fantastic. So, you know, we've got someone from insurance company uh, who spoke to us earlier. So if let's say, for example, you are on the front line and you're processing claims and you're then, a, you know, judged against your turnaround times and service level agreements and your quality, you might be excellent at delivering all of those things. So what happens? You got identified as a real strong performer and they promote you to a team lead. If, however, that organization, and I'm not saying this organization particularly does this, I'm not saying that at all, I'm just saying generally, if that organization doesn't give you the tools, the structure, the support, and the coaching to step into that role, what tends to happen is that people get into those roles, realize, ah, I'm not doing what I was good at anymore, and I don't really know what I'm doing now, because now my job has gone from externally focusing on customers and delivering quality to internally focusing on these weird things called people. And I'm having to deal with all sorts of issues and workflow and team rosters and coaching and performance and complaints and conflict. And if you're not prepped for that, that can be a really, really difficult transition to make because what happens, most people will just go, I feel really overwhelmed. And particularly the culture that we experience here and some of the mixes of cultures we experience here is then seen as a weakness to put your hand up and say, help. I don't know what I'm doing because we then have this impression of, well, I'm a manager. I can't show weakness. Rubbish. One of the best things you can do to create trust amongst your peers, your, your, your managers and with your team is to be vulnerable. And if you turn around to someone and say, look, I'm learning this. I don't know what I'm doing. I need some support. You, you will actually find it takes a huge amount of pressure off you. So it's a lot of these negative uh, characteristics that are coming off. They could well be down to the individual, 100%. But also what I would urge you to do if you have any kind of input into organizational development, people development, if you're in HR, if you're in learning development, if you are a manager of manager, when people are promoted, please make sure that their journeys are supported in a way that these don't come out. 
And if they do come out, what you need to do is actually remove them from that position very, very quickly. Because what you're going to do is you're going to uplift one person and potentially take out 10 uh, people in their team who just have no interest in working with them. So I hope, I hope that kind of starts to set the scene because when we talk about challenging times, and that's the, the title for this session today, what we're really talking about is what we see on this screen now, this massive shift in terms of the way we're working now. We're no longer collated, I know, uh, co-located. I know some of us are back in the offices and it's starting to seem normal again, but I promise you it's not. So, so, so please don't be fooled just because the government in the UAE, for example, have started to uh, open a few things up to allow you or allow the economy to start moving again. Please don't think this, this disease, this virus has gone away. There's no drop, drop in, in, in new cases every day that's coming out. But yet, what, you know, it, it blew my mind. I'm seeing Friday and Saturday, particularly Friday, as soon as the bands lifted, there's people going out to pubs and clubs and bars and malls. It's like, okay, you've got some freedom. I understand how being locked up can be an issue, but please, please don't think this is going away. The fact that we can now get 30% of our staff back into offices, that's a great thing. It's going to start moving business forward. But, but please, 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 let's, let's move forward you know, with a little bit of caution. Now, whether you are back in the office or you're still operating like this, what I'm going to cover you with you today will be 100% relevant. Okay? But um, it's important, first of all, we just initially distinguish between these two terms, leader and a manager. Now, these two terms are often used interchangeably. Okay? and then not. And one thing I really want to make sure that we leave here today, if nothing else, is that we have a distinguished uh, idea between a leader and a manager. In its simplest form, leadership is about people. Manager is about task. Now, that is a really basic way of describing it. That as a leader, your role is to essentially inspire the people around you. And that is either setting a vision or taking the vision of the organization or your leadership and translating that for other people into something that's engaging and inspiring. You need to build commitment with individuals and teams, and you need to create that visionary approach. And once again, if you think, well, I'm only a team leader of, of a call center, doesn't matter. If you have a vision of how that team should operate and how you want to be, then that exactly is what's gonna drive your, your behavior and your leadership philosophy. Now, as opposed to this, managers on the other hand, are great administrators. They manage process, they keep things on track, they manage their resources effectively, and they maintain order within organizations. So here's the thing, not one of these is better than the other. You might have a slightly unconsciously biased opinion towards one of them or the other, but they, they both have their value. They both have their value. And here's the thing, in a lot of roles in organizations, we do need to be both, okay? Now, what most people will find is that they will naturally have more of a leadership behavior that come out or natural to have more of a management behavior that comes out. Your responsibility, if you are a leader, is to make sure that you can create some form of balance to this without effectively going away from yourself and losing your own, uh, how can I put it, your own way of working, your own style, your own personality, your own uh, philosophy of leadership. So look, this might be something you're familiar with, and this is um, a model that we, we cover off every so often uh, when, I, when I talk to people about this kind of thing. But what I'd like to talk to you today about, particularly about how you can apply this framework today, is um, a model called action-centered leadership, which was developed by a guy called John Adair. So in the 60s and 70s, John Adair was, was a lecturer on leadership at Sandhurst Military College, which is essentially a British, uh, British Army officer training school. And he developed this theory and he published it in 1973, okay? So what are we talking now? We're talking 47 years, nearly 50 years ago. And a lot of the stuff that, that came out in the 60s and 70s in terms of, of theories that we use and, and frameworks we use in businesses now are very powerful. They've stood the test of time. So action-centered leadership, uh, Herzberg's theory of motivation, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, situational leadership, all of this came out of almost like a golden period of research into organization development and leadership. I really like John Adair's uh, model when it, become, when it comes to thinking about how you're going to lead. Particularly, I find it useful to get conscious of this in difficult times. Now, whether this is because of coronavirus or because you've got a budget um, constraint or you've got, you know, your, your sales have dropped off, it could be anything that creates a challenging time. Now, in his model, if you haven't seen this before, John Adair elicited three areas of focus that a manager needs to have. And the first one of those is 
basically achievement of task. So what or how do you as a manager make sure that you get your deliverables delivered? The next one is about focus on individual development. So if I'm a team leader, or I, I'm a leader of a business, I might have a hundred people in there. And as I go down my organizational chart, there might be five or six people that report directly to me. My focus needs to be on the individual development. And then the third thing I need to think about is the team. So this is about creating a cohesive, engaged team, which consists of trusting individuals, people that aren't afraid to lean into conflict. And I mean healthy conflict, where we can discuss disagreements, where I can hold each other accountable for tasks, where we have set understanding and agreed understanding of performance standards and how we're going to interact. So what we're going to do is that very briefly today, I'm going to touch on each of these tasks and I'm going to you know, kind of offer you a little bit of a challenge for those of you that have leadership positions. And I do use the word leadership. You might be thinking to yourself, my job's kind of more management based on what we've just defined. But I'd like you to start shifting your mindset towards that leadership uh, element. Now, if you want to know more about this, this is 100% something that I'd, I'd ask you to go away and Google and have a look at John Adair's website or Adair International um, is something that you can look at. I'm actually going to refer you to their site a little bit later um, because there's one step in this process if you'd like to do it that you can do yourself. So let's have a quick look at these, these couple of areas here. Um, one of the first things that we're going to, uh, the first thing we're going to look at is achievement of task. Now, what are some of the things that you need to focus on as a manager? So as a manager, when you're talking about achievement of task, really what we want you to be doing and what you need to be thinking about is, have I set clear objectives for everybody? Is everybody clear on their role when it comes to delivering the work that we need to deliver? So setting objectives, ideally, that are linked to your, your department's objectives and which are linked to your organizational objectives. Actually, remove the word ideally. They have to be, otherwise there's no point. If you have an organizational plan and you as an individual are working on a task that is not in line and dovetailing to that, then you shouldn't be doing it, okay? Which brings us back into smart goal setting and the R being relevant. Is it relevant to what I'm doing? Perfect. The next thing is about planning tasks. So this is actually, you know, the more kind of management piece of understanding who's got the right skill sets, who's got the right capacity, how do I set and uh, manage workflow of my people here. Then it's allocating responsibilities. Now, if you're familiar with something called a racy matrix, um, and if you've never done anything like this before, getting hold of a, or running a racy matrix for your team is very useful. Um, RACI is, once again, you can Google this, R-A-C-I, it is an acronym and it stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted and Informed. Sometimes you'll see an S in there as well, which stands for support. And what you do is you literally list all of your tasks down one side of a, of a grid. You can do this on a flip chart on Excel and across the top then you have R-A-C-I. And every task you go through and you say, okay, you know, and the example I would use when I, when I train this is you're planning a dinner party, right? So you list all the tasks, invite guests, prepare a menu, buy the food, all the way through to washing up and putting it away, okay? And then what you do is, okay, well, if there's mum, dad, son and daughter, who is responsible, accountable uh, for each of those? Who needs to be consulted? Who needs to be informed? So for example, invites, right? Okay, so we're going to put um, the mum and dad are responsible and accountable for that. Okay, so that means they're going to do the work. And also if the work is done or the quality of it is, is down to them as well. So that's what we mean by responsible or accountable. We need to consult the kids to see if there's any of their friends they want to invite. But also we need to inform our guests. And then what you do is you go through every task in your, in your to-do list or your project and you can see then who is responsible for delivering the work. If that work is delivered or not delivered, whose head would roll or who gets the pat on the back, that's the accountable piece. Who do we need to be consulting with? Whether that's an external provider, whether it's a manager, someone else in the business, a key stakeholder, and who do we need to inform about that piece of work, okay? Now, sometimes not every task needs to have something in every box, but every task does need to be someone responsible for doing and someone accountable for doing, but you might not need to consult or inform, okay? So allocating responsibilities is a critical part to this as well. And then setting performance standards. So this is really where the question comes in of what does good look like? How do you set those standards? Now, something you know, that, that we do as a business, not necessarily individual level, but we'll set um, targets and goals for ourselves using a medal table. So we'll have, always have a must number, for example, for our revenue, that if we don't hit this, we're in trouble. And then we'll have a bronze, silver, gold. 
Um, and it's about how do we strive for that, for, that, for that next level up from where we're constantly working from. But the performance standards really are about what are we going to see as success? What are the behaviors? What are the values that we want to see delivered within our business? And it's my job as the leader to make sure those are clearly defined and that people are actually following them as well. So that, that's just a couple of things in terms of tasks. And there's a whole other list of things that we can go into. But like I said, I'm going to keep this relatively brief and succinct. So when we talk about team, now look, those of you that are still working co-located or mainly co-located, as I've been saying all along when we've been doing these kind of sessions, anytime we've touched on team spirit or leadership, 100% the rule of thumb here is over communicate. If you only held a team meeting once a week when you all shared the same office, then you should be doing a weekly meeting and a daily check-in at the very minimum, okay? Over-communicate, get in touch with people as much as possible, get them into group sessions as much as possible, create a feeling of togetherness. What you want is everyone to feel that they're in this together. They don't have to agree on everything that each other says, that, that's actually part of a good team is that they don't agree. But what you want is you want that connection. So building in a working rhythm where that's happening regularly is really important. The next thing, team building. A lot of people are saying, okay, well, how do we do team building when we're not co-located? It's easy. It's, it's, it's just a way of connecting with people and getting to know them as human beings, not just as robots that sit next to you at a desk. So in your group sessions, you know, I mean, for example, we're running one this week, if anyone's interested, put on a quiz, right? It doesn't take long. Um, ben, one of our team, built a quiz for us and we ran that. It was about an hour and a half and it was good fun. We had a laugh, there was a bit of banter. Um, and you can build in all sorts of things that you can do for team building. Um, a friend of mine, her company ran a virtual uh, treasure hunt where they're all at home, but each of the piece of the treasure hunt, they had to run around their houses and, and find things and do challenges. So there's absolutely ways that you can create a common goal. And that's what really team building is about, is giving people a common goal and then encouraging positive behaviors and interaction to deliver that goal. Face to face, absolutely. And it's something that you can do in an office. You can take people out for a day. You can hire us to come and do it, whatever it might be. But there's also ways that you can do that virtually. Motivation. Now, this is a, both at a team level and an individual level. But when we talk about team motivation, it really is about making sure that everyone is clear on what, what's expected of the team and the goals to make sure we're holding each other accountable for those standards. And also to make sure that each person is getting the levels, level each, the right levels of support. And here's the thing, not just from you as the manager, because that puts a huge amount of pressure on you, but it's about a huge, uh, the right levels of support from each other as well. Okay you're not always as the leader, the right person to turn to. You know, if someone in a team has got a relationship with someone and they just need to talk about, I'm um, getting a bit wound up, stuck in the house with the kids all day, 100% that's something that, that someone else can take on. Doesn't mean you can't, and it doesn't mean you should push them away if they come to you, but that whole piece of engagement and motivation does sit within the team, but it's your job as a leader to drive that and role model the behavior. And then the other thing as well is discipline. And we've talked about this before. When we talk about discipline in this sense, what we're talking about is making sure that the same standards are applied across the board. One of the, the, the characteristics that came out in worst leader that we just talked about was favoritism. And here's the thing, those leaders and managers that are guilty of doing that probably don't realize they're doing it. And I should imagine it's not something they're doing on purpose, okay? Some people may do. But once again, it's about making sure that there is a discipline and structure to the team. You hold people accountable for their deliverables. If, if you run a team meeting and someone's late for that team meeting every single day, pull them for a conversation. If you've got a nice team, pull that in front of the team, okay? It doesn't mean you've got to haul them over a bunch of coals. You can make that a little bit light and fun, but just even say to the team, look, once again, team, we set a team meeting here for X amount of, of minutes per day, and it starts at this time. It's a really important rule here on time. What's going to stop us doing that? Okay. Now, you know, you might be speaking to one or two individuals specifically in that moment, but making sure that the team are aware of it is vital. Okay. So we have task, we have team. And then the last focus in a DARES model is looking at the individual development of, of needs. So the first thing we're going to look at is coaching. If this isn't something you've been doing um, during your time as a team leader anyway, it's 100% the time to step up and lean into this, okay? So coaching is, by definition, a structured and planned process to develop specific skill sets. Now, you can make these job-specific skills, you can make them soft skills. But here's the thing, coaching isn't something where you have one conversation with someone and then all of a sudden they're a, a world-class player. 
This is something that goes on over a period of time. So if you might have a coaching call with someone every once or every, or every two weeks, uh, but the theme needs to continue. So coaching is really important because you as the manager, here's the thing, you don't have to be an expert in what they're doing. What you need to be an expert in is asking the right questions, listening really well, shutting up when they're replying, and then being able to draw out what they believe their right or best course of action is to be. You can absolutely make suggestions to that 100%. And it's something I think in a couple of weeks, we're going to run a session uh, on coaching conversations if you're interested in learning more. Um, that's one of our webinars coming up. The other thing as well is counseling. Now, just to distinguish, we're not talking about mental health counseling. Um, you know, Ben runs a couple of programs. We, we teach managers on how to have these conversations, but we don't teach you how to be a counselor. Um, so you've got to be careful in terms of our definition of the term here. What we mean by counseling here is of just having that opportunity to have an unstructured, informal conversation with someone where they come to you with a problem and you can help guide them. Maybe some of that is based on your own experience. Maybe some of that is just based on some good questioning. So there's elements of coaching that comes into that conversation, but there's, it's not necessarily something that is recorded and something that is followed up on a, on a weekly or fortnightly basis. Okay, development. Now here's something I've, I've always had a little bit of a pet peeve about. Um, I've been involved in learning development for, for 20 odd years. And whenever I, not whenever, that's, that's a, an extreme example, but a lot of the time I'll speak to, to, to managers and I'll talk to them about their team. And essentially what they tell me is, well, I don't get the support from learning and development or the HR department. And here's the big thing, the, the big reveal is, if you're a manager of people, learning and development and HR is, is there to support you. They're not there to deliver training for your people. And what I mean by that is if you're a leader of people, whether that's a team or just one person, a core responsibility of yours in that role is to improve, to develop, to train, and to grow that person. When you need support, resources, maybe getting people onto the right program or some development or some support in identifying their needs, that's when you go to a learning development department. That's when you go to HR. But don't just think, oh, okay, well, Ahmed in my teams need development. I'll just send an email to learning and development or HR. The first thing I always ask managers is, okay, great. So you've referred them for HR for training. What have you done? What have you done in terms of counseling or coaching or providing them resources or directing them to a book, a webinar, a podcast, anything? And more importantly, what have they done for themselves? But those conversations need to come from the leader. And then once again, we're talking here motivating on an individual basis. Each person will have their own drivers for coming to work. But if you've ever seen Herzberg's theory of motivation, what he basically elicits is there's three groupings of factors that uh, motivate people and he re referred them to them as motivating factors demotivating factors and then the one in the middle essentially is hygiene factors so hygiene factors are basically elements in your um, uh, setup that don't necessarily motivate people if they're there but they can demotivate people if they're not there now that might seem a bit strange. So let me give you an example. And one I love saying out when I've got a group of people because people go, no, boo, and they always disagree. Money, your salary. Just think for a moment. Is, is, is money, is that a motivator? Now some of you might nod, some of you might shake your head. From a psychological point of view, I'll tell you now, money is not a motivating factor. And I'll just let that one sit there for a moment because I like getting into interesting little arguments when we run this as a group. Money might be the reason that you get up in the morning because you've got to pay your bills. But the way you get up is really what's, dry, what's telling us about your motivation. Does your alarm go off and you hit the button five times, you slowly drag yourself out of bed and crawl to the bathroom because you know you've got to sit in traffic for an hour and get to the office to sit there and do work. That's not motivation. That's not, you know, that, that is literally going to work because you need money to pay bills. If your alarm goes off and then you're out of bed, Hey, I've got work today. Looking forward to my next set of challenges. You're in there singing in the shower, getting ready. You're dancing off to your car, whatever it might be. Money is a, is a factor that is what's referred to as hygiene factor. So what Herzberg said, if you feel you are underpaid, that will be a demotivating factor. If, however, you are overpaid, it doesn't necessarily become a motivating factor. It might be if you get a pay rise, it might give you a little, ooh, for a couple of days. But motivation isn't about a couple of days. It's about a constant drive. So things as a leader that you can do that motivates people, and this is what is, that falls into his motivating factors, are recognition. So if someone's done a good job, make them aware that you've seen that. Make that public as well, if, if needs be. 
career opportunities, development, a feeling of connectivity at work, a feeling of part of something bigger than themselves. Now, even if you are the team leader of six people in a 5,000 people organization, there's six people that you can help with that. There's six people that through your behavior and the way you role model your day-to-day -day interactions can 100% change the way that they come to work feeling about themselves, feeling about their job, and more importantly, feeling about their customers and how they're gonna be delivering value. So motivation is, is a critical key, and it's not just about fighting for a pay rise for people. On a day-to-day -day basis, if you can give people a little uplift, discipline them when necessary, um, and give them the opportunity to grow, you'll see motivation 100% rise, okay? So there's some of the behaviors we wanna be looking at at an individual level. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna um, just come out of this one sec, oops, stop that, okay? I'm just gonna come out of this for one second and I'm going to see if I can do something to, to make this a little bit more engaging. What I'm gonna do is, I've just got to test, I'm gonna just break us out um into maybe 10 different rooms so we're going to have uh, let's do a little bit more we're going to have five or six people in each room okay now in that i'm going to ask you to oh, i just realized i must share my screen again uh, i'm going to ask you please to do one thing i'm going to ask you to consider the outcome or the consequence i'll do that in a second the consequence or the outcome of not having a balanced view so what I'd like you to do is whether you just want to take a quick picture of that or just scribble that down I'm going to just put you out into a into a smaller group for five or six minutes and I'd like you to think about what happens if the leader or the manager is just focused on task what if they're just focused on the team and what if they're just focused on the individual so really what I'm asking you to do is if we're only focusing on one of these key elements what is going to the slip? Maybe what are the behaviors that we're gonna see that we don't want to see? What's gonna come out from the team or the organization uh, or, or the, the, the team structure, okay? So if I can ask you once again to either grab that as a, as a image or to just scribble those three things down. Like I said, when, I'm, when we go into our break room, breakout rooms now, there's gonna be six or seven people in each room before we go, I'm gonna ask everyone to unmute your microphones um, and I'm gonna ask you to share these conversations. Amazing, well, welcome back. I think everybody's come back in at the moment. Um, what, what I'd love to hear, I was involved in, I think we were in room 10 um, and there was some good conversation really kind of, a, a lot of it was driven to, you know, if, you, if you're only focusing on one of these things, a, a key word that kept coming out was burnout. Um, is there anything else that anyone else would like to share from their group? For example, if we had a manager that was purely focused on, on task delivery, what were some of the, the, the outputs of that? Um, feel free once again to hit your microphone and speak up. Uh, hit your space bar to open your microphone and, and share with us. Yeah, hi, Russell. Hi, Lena. Yeah, I'd like to speak. I'm from room number two. So we all agreed that this will have a, like a consequence on the, uh, the motivation of the team. So the team will feel uh, a lack of focus and interest. Yep. So this could cause a big demotivation. Yep, absolutely. And yes, I also can add that they will not be clear if they are not clear on the objectives. Uh, like the, the way uh, you mentioned before, they should be clear. Otherwise, like uh, the task wouldn't be achieved properly. Yeah, also, and, and the other, we talked about this in a couple of other sessions as well, where, where the manager will set, you know, just set a task and some, you know, I use the term a drive-by uh, when managers comes and dump stuff on people. And once again, are we really making sure that we've clarified what our priority is? Uh, and one thing that I've mentioned before in one of these calls or one of these sessions before is you can't have multiple priorities. It's, it's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as priorities. Priority is a singular <laughs> So it comes from the Latin word, which means that that comes from what came before. Uh, oh, sorry, that was from that what comes before. So what that means is you can only have one. You can only have one, you know, leader of a race, as an example. So it's really important to understand what are our goals? Are they linked to the organization? Are we demonstrating that we have a clear understanding of those and that we are prioritizing tasks? So if you've got 10 tasks, only one of them can be your priority is the key point. But what I see from a lot of, managers is everything is a priority and you get this scattergun approach and it creates a, a, an element of, of 
or a lack of clarity with people's work and, and they tend to jump from one thing to the other without really focusing on, on that one task. So I, I think that's a really nice thing there as well. So look, just in the interest of time, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just kind of lean us back into the last couple of pieces just to help you beyond an hour's conversation um, with me talking at a screen and hopefully you listening, what we can do as leaders. So let me just roll back into my presentation very briefly. Um, <clears throat> so this was the last slide I left you at. So look, here's, here's essentially the other thing as well. As part of his model, John Adair elicits 11 leadership functions. Um, and uh, I'll show you what these are as well. Now, if you want to go ahead and get yourself an assessment, I'll send you the link to his website. And for the full assessment, it's, it's not a lot of money at all. It's less, it's less like 80 dirhams, I think. Or I might have quoted the wrong because there's three levels of assessment. But what you do is you get your profile and you also get um, feedback against each of these 11. So the 11 functions that he elicits in his model is, as you can see, defining task, planning, briefing, organizing, evaluating, controlling, supporting, motivating, inspiring, setting an example and reviewing. And so when you go through your um, action-centered leaders assessment, you actually, for want of a better word, get a score against each of those. So you can see where your natural strengths are and where your areas are that you know, potentially need, need a little bit of work. So for me, when I've done mine in the past, Defining task is something that is an area for development of me. Planning is an area for development for me. And evaluating 100% is an area of development for me. Where, where I'm strong is supporting, motivating, inspiring, and setting an example. Now, whether that comes across in my day-to-day -day actions and behaviors to my team, I'd like to think so. But the way I see myself and when I got my report back from that, it seemed pretty straightforward to me. And it gave me a plan to, to kind of clearly move forward into so look, what, what can you do as if you are a leader or you have people in leadership positions that you can support? The first step, 100% is to assess yourself. Um, once again, if you go to John Adair or Adair International, you will find those assessments on there. You can do them individually. You can get them for your team as well. The next thing is then I always recommend people to keep an activity log. So you could do this now. If you even sit back at the end of this call and list everything you've done with your team for the last two weeks, and then go through and label each of them, whether you think it was focused on team, task, or individual. And what you'll be able to see is the way I've been kind of naturally behaving or responding to this current situation, where has my focus gone? Now, you could argue if there's a lot of task on there, well, that's because of the situation. We're having to work differently. You sure? Okay. There's always a reason for everything. But what I'm going to ask you to do is think about, okay, in the next two to four weeks, if I'm going to list everything I want to do, or the way to do it is write three columns, team, task, and individual, and then write tasks that you can deliver um, over the next couple of weeks. So for example, if you're a team leader and you haven't had a one-to-one -one with your team in the last two to four weeks, get it in your diary now. You know, in the next seven days, at least have a one-to-one -one with everyone in your team. Okay. Keep an activity log and identify the opportunities you've got to make changes. And then the final piece that would kind of move you towards that is actively and conscientiously aim to create a balance between those three areas. It doesn't mean you're always going to get it right. And 100%, there's going to be times where, do you know what? I need 100% focus on task. I need 100% focus on the team or I need 100% focus on, on the individual. I'm not talking about this is in everything that you have to do. But if you were to sit back and almost review your year as a leader, you want to be coming out with being able to say, I created, or I was able to create a good balance across these three areas. So these are just four little ways that we can, you know, you can help yourself do that. So self-assessment, um, keep an activity log, identify the opportunities and consciously uh, aim to create that balance. So look, the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to roll this into our, our usual um, last kind of, feedback here because I'm going to wrap up our session today because we're up to an hour. What I'd like to do as always is to get your feedback, you know, um, in terms of how good the session was, how good I've been, what content is that you want to see in the future. We are looking at, you know, at least for training companies, 2nd of July is when the KHDA said that training can happen again. So everything that we're going to be doing is going to be online. We're going to continue to be adding as much value as we possibly can uh, by delivering these sessions for free. As Ben spoke to you all about earlier, if you're at the beginning of the call, if we can get you know, some, some deeper dives for you, we'd love to be able to do that because I'll be honest, it helps us pay the bills, it helps us pay our team salaries and helps us moving forward. But also what we've actually built, I'm really proud of the content. Um, and you know, one thing that myself and Ben have been doing over the last few weeks when we're delivering these is having a lot of fun 
uh, delivering and interacting with you. We do generally get pretty good feedback from you all as well. So even if you don't fill in the survey, please feel free to drop us a note, drop us a line, um, mention us on LinkedIn, anything that you could do. If you've got any value out of any of the sessions we've got or, or been doing, I'd really appreciate that because it helps us just get the word out there. So look, what we've got coming up in the next few weeks is we've got our, on Wednesday, our expert guest panel. Um, so it's wellbeing in action. And Ben talked to you about the speakers earlier. Now on Thursday, we've got what we're calling an isolation quiz. It is open to anybody. If you've got a team at work and you want to get four or five people together, fantastic, then please do that. If not, then we'll just get people into small teams anyway. Um, and that's going to be a little bit of, I think it's going to be quite fun the way we've designed to do that as well. And it also kind of just ease you into the weekend a little bit as well. And then next week, we've got two sessions that I'm running, one on coaching conversations. So we'll have a deeper dive into the structure of how you can run some sessions. I'm going to talk to you about some tactical selling, um, particularly when you are in this market where people aren't necessarily actively buying. I'm going to help you be a bit more proactive um, in, in the way you think about that. And then the week after that, Ben's going to be running problem solving and decision making over two parts as well. So if there's any interest, any of those to do, you can follow the link. Um, the guys might put it into the chat if, if I'm not calling them out on anything too, too, uh, that they're unprepared for. But once again, email us, reach out. Even if you want to put a note in the chat saying, please send me the link, we'll get it to you directly. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on some of those. Now, the last thing before you do go, I will just also put into the chat a link to the John Adair website. Um, and if you have any interest in having a little bit of a deep dive around your own skill sets, I highly recommend you jump into those. So let me just jump back into this, stop my share and jump into the chat. Thank you very much. Right, I see quite a few comments on the chat. That is the link to John Adair. So before I wrap up, because it's 11 o'clock, did anyone else have something to say? So look, it's, it's 11 o'clock. I think this is the first time we, we've kind of got to our wrap up um, almost perfectly on time. Before I finish, was there, was there any questions that came up in the panel, Ben? Um, not in the, uh, the chat, no. But okay. if it's to leave us a quick uh, question or open your mic, we may be able to fit one or two in before we close the session. So we'll just leave our standard 10 seconds for anyone who wants to jump in and, and ask a question. And there's the uncomfortable silence over. Amazing. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Ben. If you could um, take your screen off, that would be fantastic. Look, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, like I said, we've got our next one, as you just saw on Wednesday, which is going to be a really cool discussion um, hosted by Ben. We've got some really good uh, panelists in there and also good to see an all female lineup as well. So please jump in, support that, um, see what those guys are doing, see what they can learn uh, or, or you can learn from them and see what they can learn from you. And we look forward to speaking to you all again in the future. Thanks for those of you that have joined for the first time today and we'll see you in the future. All the best. Thank you. <laughs>